Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, my name is Dave. If you've not met me before, uh, I'm one of the elders um, here at Cornerstone Church. Those are sobering words that we read, aren't they? You must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And Jesus says the consequences for not being ready are incredibly serious, as serious as it gets. It is absolutely vital that we are ready for Jesus' return. In fact, in, in the light of what Jesus says in Matthew 24, there is nothing more important, is there? For every single person in this room, every single person in, in ABC and Discover and Crash. There's nothing more important for every single person on this planet than to be ready for Jesus' return. And yet I suspect the future is something that we think very little about. Um, not, not the future generally. I think we probably think about that quite a lot, don't we? We think about what's going to happen with energy prices or interest rates. We think about our career where we want to be in 5 or 10 or 15 years' time, we think about our retirement or our children and their future, all, all important things to consider. But I suspect if we're honest, Jesus' return isn't in our thinking as much as it should be. Perhaps his return is pushed so far into the future that it doesn't really concern us in the here and now. And it should. We know it should. It should because we need to be ready for it, but also it should because the Apostle Paul says we ought to long for it. He says the mark of a Christian, a mark of a Christian is someone who's longing for Jesus' return. Listen to these words from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Paul says, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. We're to be those who long for the return of Jesus. There are only three books of the New Testament that don't talk about Jesus' return, and they're really short. Jesus himself spoke about his return and the future many, many times. We need to start talking about the future. We need to be reminding each other. We need to be thinking about it more, longing for it more. And I hope this morning as we consider this topic of the future... I hope that might be the result. If you're here for the first time or you've not been with us for the past few weeks, let me explain. In our sermon series the past few weeks, we've been thinking about some key doctrines that we believe as a church. And we've been working our way through our statement of faith. And this morning is the final week of that series. And we're thinking about the future, the return of Jesus. And in a moment, I'm going to read our statement of faith and what it says about the future. Uh, before I do that, let me pray and let's ask for God's help as we consider these things together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God who is in control of all things. All the future is in your hands. And so we pray now that we would listen to what you say in your word about the future. Please challenge us in our complacency and encourage us and strengthen us in our struggle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, here's what our statement of faith says um, about the future. Uh, this is what it says. Let me read it. The Lord Jesus Christ will return in glory. He will raise the dead and judge the world in righteousness. The wicked will be sent to eternal punishment and the righteous will be welcomed into a life of eternal joy in fellowship with God. God will make all things new and will be glorified forever. We're going to um, think about each of those things a little bit this morning. Let me give you a bit of a map of where we're heading. You can follow on the handout if you want. Firstly, I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about the actual event of Jesus' return. The statement of faith says the Lord Jesus Christ will return. It's certain. Um, I want us to think a bit about what the Bible says that, that return will be like. Secondly, we're going to think about what will happen as a result of Jesus' return. So the statement of faith says, 
talks about judgment and uh, raising the dead. We're going to think a bit about those things. Uh, And uh, thirdly, by way of application, we're going to think about what we ought to do now whilst we wait for Jesus to return. So um, point number one, Jesus will return. And And it would be helpful if you've got Matthew 24 open. Keep a finger in Matthew 24. But just turn back to Isaiah um, chapter 11, it's page 697, turn back to Isaiah 11, 697, and I want you to see firstly that Jesus' return is essential, it's essential. And I want to start here because I wonder whether sometimes we've not really grasped this to be the case. The return of Jesus is not like an appendix to a book. You know, if you ever get a book with an appendix, um, it's only the most committed people, isn't it, who read the appendix. Usually I'm just glad that the book isn't as long as I thought it was. Um, If it was, uh, if the appendix, you know, the appendix isn't as important as the rest of it, is it? Or at least that's what I think. I don't know if that's true. If it was important, it would be included in the main bit, wouldn't it? Be a proper chapter. It's a, it's a bonus chapter. And an appendix, the content doesn't really affect what's come before. You can take it or leave it. Jesus' return is not an appendix to God's story. It is absolutely vital. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Listen to these words of Paul. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Just just think for a minute about what Paul is saying there. I think it's really striking. He's saying, look, if you don't think Jesus is going to return, don't be a Christian. It's not worth it. It's only worth it if you believe He will return. You can't take it or leave it. Jesus' return is essential for us. And more importantly than that, it's essential for the whole of God's story. If we miss out this chapter of God's story, then the whole thing changes. Jesus' return is the essential resolution. You know, back in the Garden of Eden, God was king of his world But Adam and Eve denied God's kingship. They rebelled against his authority. And the whole Bible story from that point on is about God bringing his kingdom where he will reign and his rule will no longer be denied. And that kingdom is going to be ruled by Jesus. One way to describe the the story of the Bible is that it's God re-establishing his kingdom where his king will rule unopposed forever. So Jesus' return in glory is the essential resolution to that story. It's the part where Jesus' rule will be recognized and honored by everybody. In a way, that rule has already begun, hasn't it? Because we are gathered here this morning as people who recognize the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. But his rule will be seen and honored by everybody, without exception, when he returns In glory, which is part of the reason why Paul says we ought to long for his appearing. Look down to Isaiah chapter 11 and just glance at those verses that we read again. It describes God's king. Verse 4 says, He will rule with righteousness, He'll judge the wicked. In verse 4. Verses 6 to 9 describe the world under his rule. The the wolf will live with the lamb. It will be a world of perfect harmony, the the created order in perfect harmony because Jesus rules. Verse 9, when he rules, the, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is Eden restored, isn't it? Jesus' return is not an appendix to God's story, it's the essential resolution, not a bonus chapter. Part of the reason I picked Isaiah 11 to show you that is I want you to, to, to see that this is not just a New Testament idea. It's promised throughout the Old Testament. Jesus' return is essential. 
Flip back to Matthew 24. If you've lost it, it's page 994. I want us to see what else that the Bible says about Jesus' return. Jesus says, he, even, he says he himself uh, doesn't know when it will be. It'll be unexpected. Look at verse 36. About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In fact, Jesus says, verse 42, his return will be like a thief. Verse 42, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready. If anyone tells you they know the date of Jesus' return, and many people make claims like that all the time, don't believe them. Even Jesus doesn't know. We won't expect it. There won't be an advert in the news. He'll come like a thief. It'll be unexpected. And it will be unmissable. There is no chance that it's happened already without us knowing. When I I used to live in Singapore, um, and there were quite a few times I ended up chatting to people who belonged to a particular cult, And one of their beliefs, amongst others, was that Jesus had already come. It's also a mistake that um, the church in Thessalonica made in Paul's day. You can read about it in 2 Thessalonians. But look back at Matthew 24. Just turn back one page to page 993. And look at verse 30 and 31. Jesus is talking about what's going to happen when he returns. He says... Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the people of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You you won't miss it. Or, Or look at verse 27. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He won't come in a hidden way. A hidden way, it will be unmissable and unavoidable. No one's going to escape the impact of Jesus' coming. There's not going to be a remote location somewhere where people don't realize or or, or not affected by Jesus' coming. All the peoples of the earth will know when he comes. He'll be unmissable. And this, this essential, unexpected, unmissable return is near. Look at, again at verse 42, Jesus' is warning. <coughs> Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. We always need to be ready, because he could come at any time. There is going to be a delay. There has been a delay, hasn't there? It's been 2,000 years and counting. But look down to verse 45 to 51. Jesus tells this parable of a master who puts his servant, his most faithful servant, in charge of his household whilst he's away. In verse 48, the servant says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. There will be a delay before Jesus returns. But it's not an unforeseen delay. It's a planned delay. Um, I don't know that you remember a few months back, we looked at the book of 2 Peter, and in 2 Peter we're told the delay is because of God's patience. He's giving people time to turn back to him. And Jesus' point here in Matthew is the delay doesn't mean we should start to think, well, I don't need to be ready today. Maybe I don't even need to be ready till, I don't know, 2024, 2030. No, we need to be ready now because he could return at any time. His return is near and is certain, certain. You know, the fact that there's a delay in Jesus' return could make us start to doubt that it's ever going to happen. The longer you wait for something, the less you believe it will happen. I'm hoping Blackburn Rovers 
might get to promoted to the Premier League this year, but it has been over 10 years since uh, we were there, and the longer I wait, the less confidence I have that we will ever do it. But despite the delay, we can have confidence that Jesus will return. And the way the Bible gives us confidence about his return is reminding us that what God will do on that day, he's already done before. Do you remember last year we looked at the book of Genesis and we thought about the story of Noah? That was the story when God unexpectedly judged the entire world. Jesus mentions it in Matthew 24, doesn't he? Verse 37. He says his return will be like what happened in the story of Noah. One day people will be eating and drinking and then suddenly the end will come. No one expected it. So, so don't think God is not going to do what he will said he'll, said he'll do. He's done it before. And we can have confidence that he'll do it again. Jesus' return is certain, essential, unexpected, unmissable, near, and certain. Which is why we must be ready. We'll think more about what being ready means um, at, at the end. Before we do that, I want to think about point number two. If you're following on the handout, what will that day bring? What will that day be like? What what will be the effect of Jesus' return? What will he do? I want to read you some words from John chapter (coughs) 5 on the screen. Listen to these words from from Jesus in John 5. Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. On the day that Jesus returns, everyone will meet him. His job will will be the job of judge. In fact, John, John 5 says that God has granted Jesus the authority not only to judge, but also to give life. And so as everyone meets Jesus, there will be a separation. Those who have heard his word and believe in him will receive eternal life. But those who have not acknowledged Jesus will face condemnation and punishment. And the Bible calls that place of punishment hell. Hopefully you've still got Matthew 24 open. Just look down to verse 51. Remember I said this is a parable Jesus is telling about a wicked servant who's been put in charge of the household by his master. And when the master returns, he finds that this wicked servant has misused his authority. And verse 51 describes what the master will do with the wicked servant. And it tells us something about hell. Verse 51, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, this is part of the parable, but nevertheless, Jesus is saying it because it tells us something true about what God will do with those who ignore him and rebel against him. And whenever the Bible speaks about hell, this is the kind of language that it uses. Look over the page, Matthew 25, verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This is the kind of vocabulary that the Bible uses. Hell is a truly awful place. Verse 46 also describes it as eternal punishment. Which is exactly how our statement of faith puts it. And that is important to to emphasize. 
Some Christians have tried to argue that hell is actually a place where people are annihilated. There's immediate punishment, but no longer kind of eternal conscious punishment. I don't think it's possible to hold that view with these words of Jesus here. And in fact, many more that he says about hell. Jesus is clear, hell is eternal. In Luke's gospel, Jesus says, don't fear those who can only kill the body, but fear God because there is a fate worse than death. Hell is not annihilation. It is conscious, eternal punishment. And I realize that might be hard for us to hear and to think about. Hard because all of us will know people close to us who are not Christians. And not only that, maybe we struggle with the idea that hell could be fair. How can hell be fair? We need to remind ourselves that God is just. There is no unjust punishment in hell. And you know, perhaps part of the reason we struggle with the fairness of hell is because we forget the incredible seriousness of our sin. Sin is not a small misdemeanor. Sin is treason against our maker. And the gravity of sin is because of the majesty of the person we've sinned against. If I do something wrong to you, that's serious isn't it? If I do something wrong, let's say, towards the prime minister, I'm going to be in a whole lot more trouble. If I do something wrong towards the king, perhaps even more trouble. How much more serious is it when we've wronged God? Hell is an awful place. Eternal conscious punishment. It's fair. And so one application we ought to make right here and now is, is we have an obligation to warn people, don't we? God is calling people to come to him. He's given his son so that we don't need to end up in the place that we deserve. And if we take the reality of hell seriously, we must warn people lovingly of the danger they face. The other thing I need to say is if you're here and you're not a Christian this morning, please make sure you don't end up in hell. Come to Jesus. Those who hear his word and believe in him will graciously have life. When Jesus returns, he'll judge the world. It will be an awful day for some. But for those who have believed in Jesus' words, it will be a glorious day. On that day, God's people will receive eternal life. I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. Uh, let me tell you what page it is. You might want to keep, sorry, you might want to keep a finger in Matthew 24. Um, but turn back to Revelation 21. Turn to Revelation 21, page 1249. One, two, four, nine. I want to read verses one to four for us. And uh, these verses speak about the glorious future that awaits God's people. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. When Jesus returns, God will make all things new, a new creation. And quite often we speak 
about heaven being the final destination of Christians, don't we? We speak about heaven and hell as opposing realities. But actually, whereas hell is the final destination for those who are not Christians, heaven is not our final destination. Let me be clear what I mean. Before Jesus returns, all God's people who die go to be with the Lord Jesus. Think about what Jesus says to the thief on the cross. Do you remember he says he promises that today you will be with me in paradise. Paul says the same thing. Paul says, incredibly, Paul says he wouldn't mind death because it will mean he'd go to be with Christ. All those who are God's people who die go to be with Christ which is better by far. But that's not our final destination. What's described here in Revelation 21 is our final destination, a new creation. A place which will make this world seem, as C.S. Lewis put it, as if it was just the Shadowlands. The real world is still to come. It'll be a physical place. Like this world, that's clear, isn't it, from Revelation 21? It's a city, a city where all God's people will dwell. It'll be a perfect place. No hospitals, no hearses, no crying, no mourning, no pain, no tears. A place where God himself will wipe our tears away. A place of eternal life, a glorious place. God's people will receive eternal life. And in that place, God will be glorified forever. Just look at verse 5 of Revelation 21. What's the centerpiece of this city? The centerpiece is that God is on the throne. Time and time again in Revelation, the picture of God's people in that place is the picture of people worshipping God. We'll be doing the very thing that we are made for, knowing him, enjoying him, worshipping him, glorifying him. John Piper makes a really challenging point about this in one of his books. He says something along the lines of, you know, if we could look forward to a new creation where God wasn't there, If we think that would be enjoyable, we've missed the whole point of everything that God is doing. There is no happiness without God and knowing him and worshipping him. It's what we were made for. And in that new creation, the best thing about that place is that God will be there on the throne and we will glorify him forever. So, Point three, as we end, how should we wait? How should we wait until Jesus returns? Well, most obviously, I want to say, we must not give up. We must not give up. Don't throw it away. Make sure you get to the finish line. Some of us uh, will remember Paula Radcliffe, the, the British long distance runner finishing the, or failing to finish the marathon, 2004 in Athens, the Olympics. She was the favorite for gold and she had to pull out 22 miles, four miles to go. If this is the future that we are heading to, make sure you get to the end. Keep following Jesus, don't give up. And serve him faithfully. Look at Matthew 24 and verse 44. Jesus says, So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. We need to be ready for the Master. If Jesus were to come back tomorrow, would he find you involved in the things that you'd want him to see? What would Jesus make of your priorities? If you step back and you look at your priorities right now, do they make sense in the light of Jesus' return? Or do they only make sense if this world is all there is? 
I think that's why Paul says those words we read um, near the start. I think they might appear on the screen again. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, Paul expects a Christian life to be a life which only makes sense in the light of eternity. A life in which people who are not Christians might look at us and and see how we've given ourselves for Christ and the gospel and they would think, what a waste. And if you are doing that, perhaps, perhaps you do sometimes think, am I wasting my life for Jesus? Well, when you reach the end, you won't think that. Be ready for the master. Don't give up. Serve faithfully. And wait patiently. Let let me finish with these words from Romans 8. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We must not expect too much from this world. This world is not the new creation. It is a world that will be marked with suffering. All kinds of suffering. Make sure you get your expectations right. Being a Christian does not mean an escape from suffering in this life. We're not to be surprised by suffering or hardship. But the suffering of this world ought to to make us groan and long to escape the shadowlands and to be with Jesus in the world to come. And Paul says our sufferings now are not worth comparing. It's the glory that is to come. So let's be those who long for his appearing. Let's be those who say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious future that lies ahead. We thank you for your amazing plan, which you've been bringing about since the, before the creation of the world to bring all your people to your perfect place to live under your glorious King, Jesus. And Lord, we want to say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Help us be those who long for his appearing. And until he comes, help us serve him faithfully and wait for him patiently and expectantly. In Jesus' name, amen.